I think it's been a fantastic day so far. I'm sure I speak for everyone. Um, I know all the sessions that I've been in have been really excellent. Uh, my name is Fiona. I'm from the editorial board of Socialist Appeal. I just want to say it's so amazing to see so many people here, um, so many people in this room. Uh, there's a lot of international guests with us um, at this event. It was spoken about yesterday. But I think it's worth reiterating, you know, that this is a truly international event. Um, we've got comrades from, from Canada, um, from Austria, Germany. Give us a whoop <laughs> if, you're in the, if you're in the room. Uh, Sweden, Denmark, France, <laughs> the Netherlands, <laughs> the Basque Country, Catalonia, Switzerland, Poland. <laughs> Poland, Hungary, <laughs> and I think I've forgotten too. So if I didn't, if I didn't say you, Wales. <laughs> Wales. <laughs> there you go. Well, I just can thank the Welsh comrades because we do obviously have a large contingent of comrades from all over Britain as well. Um, comrades have travelled very far. Obviously, we've got the comrades from Scotland, uh, <laughs> Falmouth. <laughs> okay, that's all I'm going to mention, <laughs> and London, Holborn. <laughs> We've travelled not so far, <laughs> well that's okay. Um, so yeah, this has been a really great day, a really great event so far. It's actually the biggest revolution festival that we've had, we've ever had. Um, we sold the most amount of tickets, um, so it's, it's been obviously very fantastic for us all to be a part of that. Um, and there's been loads of people watching online on the live streams as well. I've been told, and I think everyone's feeling good. Everyone's feeling confident. I think the future holds great things for the Marxists and the forces of Marxism in Britain. The last couple of weeks um, have been amazing for us as an organization. We've been intervening in freshers' fairs in about 53, 54 different campuses up and down the country, meeting hundreds, thousands of young people who are open to the ideas of Marxism. Um, there's probably some of you who've met us in the last six weeks and have come to this event. Um, in fact, I wanted to ask if, if this is anyone's first RevFest, if they want to put their hands up. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think on, on that basis, in the last uh, six weeks that we've had, we can expect that this time next year we can, we can fill this room. This room sits up to 1,000 people. If we've got 700 uh, tickets sold this time, then if everyone who's put their hand up now comes next time and brings another person, then we'll, we'll outlive, we'll out, you know, do the size of even this room. Um, so I think we can have that as a, as a target for us. So there's never been a more important time to be a Marxist. We've got a whole... Um, tables, lots of different tables of Marxist literature. If you've seen the front cover of the Socialist Appeal, you might have correctly noticed that it's a bit out of date. <laughs> um, this happened again a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a Socialist Appeal cover, and then um, reactionaries, essentially, reactionaries keep dying or resigning just as we go <laughs> to press, because the paces of events in Britain are moving at a very quick uh, very quick speed. And it's happening all over the world, and that's what we're here to do this weekend, discuss the state of the world, but in particular this session is to talk about what's happening in Britain and the perspectives for the British Revolution. And on that note, I'm really pleased to introduce Rob Saul, the editor of Socialist Appeal. Thank you. Well, comrades, um, it's great to be here amongst you all at this time of economic, political chaos, mayhem, disaster, you name it. So uh, I can see everybody's laughing now, everybody's happy that uh, this is the occasion. But uh, yes, events are moving extremely fast. Even we uh, didn't think uh, really they, they would get this bad. Uh, but clearly it shows how the contradictions of the past period have, have built up to such an extent that this is not just a simple crisis, but a series of crises, each of one built it on up, upon another. And therefore, I know some uh, commentators have said, well, this crisis is as bad as it was in 1956 at the series time. But... Uh, I think that's a well underestimate, uh, to be honest with you. This is probably the most serious crisis uh, for British capitalism, probably in, in, in modern history, I would say. I mean, even before 
we've had crises before, but uh, at least you had someone at the helm who had a bit of an idea what to do or what to say. Whereas today, it's, there's, there's no one there. It's, uh, it's in a complete vacuum, uh, which is obviously compounding the crisis itself. Uh, of course, the, the Europeans are uh, quite uh, happy about the chaos of the last few weeks. I can see they're rubbing their hands. After all, all the shit they had to put up with over the last five or six years about Brexit, they're not surprised. And uh, therefore, the, the newspapers have, uh, have made a meal of it. I can see uh, Le Monde, you know, that trust resignation leaves UK in deep, unprecedented political crisis. Ha <laughs> ha. El, El Pais, UK is plunged into chaos. And even the Ukrainians, uh, you know, threw in a, a tweet that I saw the other day, uh, you know, saying that, um, was the, the exact words, better call Boris, <laughs> which apparently is a play on the, the better call, call Saul, you know, of the, of the uh, Netflix series. But uh, they quickly withdrew it, uh, probably realizing, well, he may not win or he may not get here. So let's, let's uh, play safe. But you can see that they, they're, they're also uh, worried, of course, about Britain because what happens in Britain will have a knock-on effect everywhere else. As was explained uh, yesterday, that the world has never been more integrated and therefore the, the crisis in Britain is not simply a British crisis and uh, will have enormous consequences because... It's not over yet by a long shot. I know, I think it was today's Financial Times said, uh, can things get more worse for the Tories? And of course, the resounding reply will be absolutely not, given the fact that um, Boris Johnson is, is, is flying in with the suitcase full of spanners in order to throw into the works, of course. <laughs> and um, the ruling class are a bit alarmed that uh, he has a prospect of winning, actually. And, uh, of course, that means uh, further and further instability. Again, the headline in the Financial Times, investors and MPs take fright at Johnson's re uh, return. I mean, everything they seem to do has been uh, a disaster. And that's no accident, really. It's, uh, it's the whole product of, of this period that's been building up over a long period of time of the contradictions facing British capitalism and also of, of world capitalism itself. Now, we have a title uh, this evening of a discussion on uh, preparing for power, perspectives for the British Revolution. I think we should be, all, be honest and say, well, as far as the mass of ordinary people are concerned, the idea of revolution is, is pretty far-fetched. That it's not on the cards, it's not on the radar as far as they're concerned. It doesn't enter their experience, really. I mean, I think you'd say that, that was the case in relation to the lefts, particularly in Britain. We're also very skeptical about things. And they too are, uh, well, revolution, yeah, nice idea, but, you know, come on. It's not going to happen, is it? I mean, that's their kind of outlook. They're, they don't believe in it. And, um, of course, we have to uh, understand, yes, we, we, we can understand why the broad mass would feel that way because they have been conditioned by the past. Uh, their own experience has been determined by the past. And particularly the older generation, we look back to the, to the post-war period, the 1950s, the 60s, when there was full employment, when uh, council houses were built, when living standards were going up, there seemed to be a bit of hope you know, if, around at that time, and uh, that uh, had a big bearing on things. Because obviously, revolutions don't take place every two minutes. They're very rare occurrences. I mean, when was the last time we had a revolution in Britain? We'd have to go back to the 17th century and uh, the English Civil War, although, of course, we've had revolutionary um, consequences in the past period, that's for sure. You know, in the last hundred years, in 1912, the great unrest, uh, 1918, 1919, 1920, where 100,000 troops, armed troops, marched down Whitehall, demanded to be demobbed, where you had councils of action being formed in Britain and the threat of a general strike. In 1926, 
You had uh, the elements of dual power being created in Britain, but, but were, of course, betrayed by the, by the TUC. In 1931, you had the Invergordon mutiny, a uh, kind of pre-revolutionary crisis in Britain. Even after the war, with a massive victory for the Labour government, there were revolutionary overtones at that time. And probably, probably in my uh, experience, the 1970s also certainly were, was uh, very, very um, politically charged. And certainly, uh, in the, even the ruling class were, were looking for, the, uh, for civil war at that time. Well, not all, but it's an element of the ruling class. But of course, this is very, you know, it's not happening every day. The vast majority of experience is that uh, there's stability. The vast majority of experience of people is uh, generally looking at the past as, it's not revolution, but gen general stability. Although you could must qualify that and over the last 20 years, probably the generation that's in this room at the moment have only experienced crisis. But for the, for the older layers, if you like, they, they hark back to this uh, days of Keynesianism and, uh, and capitalism giving reforms because they could afford to do it on the basis of an upswing, but that upswing's gone. It's finished. It is completely over. And therefore, you know, we have to move on. We have to stand, understand what is happening. And of course, we're not saying, yes, there's going to be a revolution, you know, nine o'clock on Monday morning or around the corner. What we're saying, however, is that the objective crisis of capitalism on a world scale and in Britain are pushing events towards revolutionary consequences in every country, including in Britain. Whether we like it or not, or whether the bourgeoisie likes it or not, the system is in a dire crisis and cannot deliver what it delivered in the past. And therefore, uh, a new situation is evolving. A new normality is evolving. Uh, which is more crisis-ridden and therefore poses enormous challenges as far as the working class is concerned. Of course, we know that consciousness, people's ideas, are very conservative. You know, they cling on to what, is, uh, what, what they know. And uh, that has a, a very powerful uh, influence on people. They, 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 they hope for the best, if you like. Uh, but of course... It's events, as Ted Grant used to say, events, 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 which transform the consciousness of working class people, shakes them up, destroys the illusions that they have in the system, and then as a result, changes the whole outlook and poses the question, or is, can there something be better than we have today? And of course, I would say that certainly a lot of... Um, Worried faces out there. You know, look in people's eyes and they, they know what's coming, that, the, that the, the things are going to get very bad in Britain, worse than that they have been. And they've been pretty bad up to now. We had, what, 40 years, I would say, of counter revolution in Britain, insofar as destroying the gains of the past in the factories, in the workplaces, and, and the rights of people. Real wages in the last two decades have been. Uh, reduced, well, it's been the worst two decades than anything since Napoleonic times in relation to the fall in real wages. It's quite an, a remarkable position. And that was just an hors d'oeuvre, if you like, a little, uh, and a little, a little foretaste of what is coming. And therefore, we as, uh, as Marxists have to understand the deeper reasons uh, behind the situation. It's not wishful thinking you know, on our behalf. You know, it wouldn't be great to have a revolution. Revolution, I think, as Alan said yesterday, is a very hard thing. A revolution is not a, a tea party. And, and uh, it only happens when people are, are desperate enough to want to change their lives, take, take, their, take their possession, if you like, of the fate, their own fate, into their hands. And that takes it courage and elan and determination, which can only come when people see the need to do that. But the needs are, are born out of necessity on the basis of the crisis of the system itself. And therefore, it's not wishful uh, thinking. All the uh, equilibrium, as, we, as uh, they like to put it, has been destroyed. It's finished. It's complete disequilibrium. It's complete chaos in the world situation. 
And, uh, and therefore, that is laying the basis for fundamental change. You know, I think it was Lenin explained that uh, you know, revolution occurs when the working class cannot live as they did, and the ruling class cannot rule as they did. And there's a complete impasse, creates revolutionary conditions, including in Britain, which would be quite amazing for many people to think. Although I think the experience of the last uh, couple of weeks must be thinking, you know, you know th something's up. Something's going on here. And of course, uh, it is true. This is just the beginning of a foretaste of the deepening crisis in relation to British capitalism. Because what we are seeing in front of us, it's like, it's like a perfect storm. And uh, at a time, I mean, it's, it's um, unbelievable. You've had uh, three prime ministers in eight weeks, man. You know, Truss was a non complete non-entity, it is true. But, uh, you know, it gets the, it gets the prize for being the, the shortest lived prime minister in the whole of British history. And the same goes for the rest of the, of the camp. The home was that uh, Suella Bra Braverman, isn't it, who is the home, home secretary. She lasted uh, very little time. You had to go back to um, the Duke of Wellington in 1834 to have someone to beat her, you know, in relation to the little time span she's had as home secretary. And these are gold medals, it's, you know, these, these are prizes to be won uh, in relation to uh, Britain of all places. Britain, which uh, you have to scratch, you scratch your head and pinch yourself, you know, that these things are happening here, which was traditionally a very, very stable country altogether. And now, and, and that included the Tory party. I mean, the Tory party, I would say, in Britain, was probably the envy of the ruling classes of the world because of its success since its origins. It was a very stable, very, uh, how can I say, articulate means of carrying out the instructions of the ruling class. And they were, particularly the Europeans, are very envious of it. But now, it's completely shattered. And that is an indication of the profound change in British capitalism itself, all the main institutions, the props of British capitalism, have been undermined. Fundamentally, the distrust in, in politicians, in parliament, in the state apparatus, all those, in the monarchy, the, anything you, you, you get a name, all these things are now being questioned as part of the deepening crisis of British capitalism and are preparing the ground for changes in consciousness. It was Trotsky actually who said, he wasn't, he said revolution wasn't born out of slump or boom. It was a shift between one and the other. In other words, it was the tremendous uncertainty generated uh, by, by life that creates this, this, this um, shock, if you like, that changes consciousness itself. And that's, we're gonna be in for, this is the beginning, of shock after shock after shock after shock for the working class. And therefore, it's going to drive more and more to look for a way out of the, of the, of the problems that they face. And the speed of events, by God, it's incredible. I mean, we, 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 wrote, we wrote a document, wasn't it? I think, let's speak through, when was it? I think it was a month after Boris Johnson was elected uh, in, at the end of 1919. Uh, sorry. <laughs> well, it could have been. That will really be fortunate. No, uh, 2019 shows all I'm getting, is it? Um, and in, in this document, this British Perspectives document, after, the, after all the Tories only been in a month, an 80 majority, the Labour Party was shattered, and we write in the document, this government will be a government of crisis and in all likelihood will not achieve its full term. And I must admit, some comments think, whoa, whoa, that's getting a bit, that's a bit uh, rich, you know. Perhaps you should cool it, cool it down a bit, qualify it a bit. And said, no, no, that's going to happen. Why? Because of the objective conditions in British capitalism itself creates the instability, creates the crisis, which reflects itself politically, economically, socially, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we could have never have dreamed <laughs> of writing something that's, I mean, this is just, uh, what has happened in the last four weeks is incredible.
You couldn't, you couldn't make it up. You know, you certainly couldn't predict it in the way that it's developed, the intensity, the savagery, the depth, and all the, and, I mean, the ruling class is pulling its hair out because they cannot get a handle on the situation. They can't get a grip on it. And uh, that is obviously an extremely dangerous thing. And, uh, and therefore, they are, they are thrashing about as to what can be done at the present uh, moment. Of course, we know that, uh, you know, the ruling class and, and, and the agents, they have, oh, you know, revolution, it will never happen. And that will be the general message, of course, pumped out. Britain's a stable country, revolution could never happen. But they said that 2008 couldn't happen. They said that there, there, would no, there would be no major economic crisis on a world scale because they could manage the economy. They were very confident. That was their whole prediction. And when it came, it was a damn shock to them. It was the biggest slump in 2008, bigger than probably the early 1930s. There was a devastating one. And it could have led to a depression, but they had to bail out the capitalist system. The state had to intervene to, to prop up capitalism at that time. And then they said, well, uh, it's only going to be a one, once in a century event. And of course, uh, we see what happened after, what, 10 years of so-called growth and austerity and, and crisis in Europe. Uh, it was building up, another slump was building up, and of course, it coincided with the pandemic in, in 2020 and resulted in a devastating collapse in Britain. The GDP fell by 10%, the biggest fall in 300 years. Incredible collapse. And again, the state had to intervene and bail out the capitalist system in order to, to keep it afloat. Of course, uh, we're also going to be asked to pay, as we are being asked to pay for the crisis itself. But then they said, well, don't worry, there's going to be a recovery. And what a recovery, because people are going to spend their money now. They've been in the houses with lockdowns and so on. And they, even talk, they were even talking about a roaring 20s, like in the United States. Well, that roar didn't happen very much, did it? And it was a, a further collapse. And this is what we have at the present the moment. I've obviously brought about by other factors as well. You know, uh, the system itself is not simply driven by economics, but also politics and other factors can, can, can uh, result in it as a trigger, if you like, in order to provoke deeper crises. And what you have at the present time is, is a move towards another serious World slump, even the bourgeois recognize that, the IMF, World Bank, all of the, all the strategy of capitalists recognize they're moving into a new slump period in the next year. In fact, Britain's already in the slump. Europe is, is mostly in the slump. It's all building up at the present moment. And of course, um, this again, once again, has an enormous impact on the consciousness of the working class. But this crisis... Uh, it's not simply this or that crisis, you know, on, on energy or whatever it would be of inflation. We have to understand it's generalized crisis of the capitalist system itself. And the reason for that is capitalism has reached its limits. You know, Marx explained a long time ago that the development of history is determined by the development of the productive forces. In other words, industry, technique, science, all these things which are essential to civilized life. Um, if the society can develop them, then that society will be relatively stable. But as soon as the society is incapable of developing the productive forces, taking society forward, then opens up the period of revolution, according to Marx. This is the basis of historical materialism. And this is how we must apply this to today on the world scale and in Britain. The productive forces are being hemmed in, as was explained yesterday, by private ownership and the nation state. You know, they've created enormous potential, productive potential, and they can't use it, even in a boom. And they don't have many booms these days. 80% of capacity will be used, no more than that. In a slump, it could be 60% of capacity, even lower. They definitely, therefore, they, they cannot use this capacity. They're holding back. They, they, they hamstring the whole development of society. And that's because of capitalism and the nation state. 
It's reached a complete and utter impasse. It's what we describe as an organic crisis of capitalism. Not this or that, but a deep-rooted inherent crisis of the system which has now become a barrier to the development of society. And it is that, that is the root of the crisis of the last four weeks. That's the root of the world crisis that we're that we experiencing at the present uh, moment. And therefore, it is these fundamental objective reasons why we have a continuing deepening crisis of capitalism at the present uh, uh, moment. Of course, um, in the past, they were able to overcome some of these contradictions. You know, they worked to overcome them. What was they needed to in order to try and push things forward? But every time they, they, they overcome partially one contradiction, they create another one as a barrier. And therefore, they accumulate these contradictions by attempting to make the capitalist system work or function. And now it can only function on the basis of a colossal bailouts from the state. You talk about these monetarists and free, free marketeers and so on, but the wonders of capitalism, etc., etc. It can only function on the basis of state handouts, huge state handouts. And that's why there's enormous state debts at the present time. And that's why the working class is going to suffer in order to pay back those debts in the coming period of time. Of course, um, as was explained yesterday, the last throw with the dice, I would say, was globalization. And it, which was an intensification, the opening up, if you like, of China, of, of, of opening up different markets, extending and deepening the markets. And the, but it can, becomes a limit to that. You can only do go so far. But where else are you going to go? The moon. That's it then. You've tied it all up. And therefore, the system then reacts in a big way and is reverting to what they called in the 1930s economic nationalism. There's been a disintegration of this, of this globalization, a breaking down of the globalization. In other words, it's going into reverse, which again is compounding the massive problems of world capitalism and, of course, results in the fact there's no stability anywhere. No stability anywhere. Every country, to one degree or another, has been affected now by this capitalist crisis and there's no way out for them apart from attacking the working class but if you attack the working class you cut the market you intensify a crisis such as the contradictions of capitalism itself and this then produces all manner of phenomenon which have never been seen or, or new things emerge which are reflecting this crisis even in Britain we've had these things in 2014, you had that massive uh, support for Scottish nationalism. And that was, uh, again, a, 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 sh a shock because they, although they didn't win, they came very close, if you like, and reflected this, this uh, you know, pent-up uh, uh, anger and frustration with the status quo, with, with Westminster and so on and so forth. The Labour Party in Scotland collapsed. It had 40 seats in Scotland. It was reduced to one. It was smashed. He had all sorts of other, other things. Corbyn, the rise of Corbyn, what was that? If not, if you like, a reflection of this, this changed mood, if you like, and we fight looking for a way out. And this, this movement of, of Corbynism, again, is a reflection of the instability of capitalism. Brexit, in another way, is also a reflection of the instability that, uh, that affects British capitalism. And of course, the present day, and the collapse of governments and, and the resignation of ministers and who, the chaos, if you like, political chaos at the present time, again, is a, a reflection of the underlying crisis of British capitalism. And unless they solve that underlying crisis, they're not going to solve these other crises. And therefore, we can expect more of them to occur in the next uh, period. Of course, um, one of the great difficulties for the ruling class in Britain is the, this, this loss of control over the Tory party. It's a bit like in America, where uh, Trump took over the, you know, also, also a bit of a, is a bit crazy. He took over the Republican party in the United States. And the same process that in Britain, you, you had this, the Brexiteers in effect, 
taken over the, the Conservative Party and uh, epitomized by Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson um, really was just, he was a maverick. He wasn't interested in British capitalism as such. He was interested in Boris Johnson. And that's why they're terrified now. If he comes back, you know, uh, because he's, if he gets on the ballot paper, is he on, is he? Oh, I knew, I knew I should have looked at the, the paper before I come on here. Events, 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 comrades. <laughs> They're moving so fast. Whoa, absolutely. Well, if he's on the ballot paper, it's goodbye to you, boys. <laughs> huh? Christ almighty. I mean, no, the ruling class must be, they must be on the paper. No, see, the last one out, Cold, turn the lights off, please. I mean, that's the way they have to look at it. Their idea, and they, thought they came quite close. The Brexiteers took over the, the Tory party. Okay. But they then, the Brexiteers went a bit too far. You know, and the, obviously, they was epitomized by Liz Truss. And they thought they had it all sewn up. The Tory party, everything was, in, was now going to move forward to a creation of a deregulated economy. A kind of Singapore uh, kind of your economy. Singapore on, uh, what was it? On Thames, that's right. I think that's the, the word they use. And uh, with deregulation um, and, and opening up, if you like, of, of, of the economy to big business internationally in that way, hoping they could develop uh, British capitalism. It would have been a disaster because that's not the way it would work. But clearly they thought they had everything in the bag. And yet it all started to unwind and uh, trust was forced to bring onto a cabinet People who were opposed to Henry Hunt and chaps came onto the cabinet and the ruling class thought, great, we'll squeeze her out, get these two back in. Perhaps uh, Sunak would, get, would be elected. He's a safe pair of hands. And then we can begin to stabilize the situation. We might not be able to rescue the Tory party now, but at least we've, we've got control back over it. That's what they were hoping. But for, for Johnson, I'm not saying Johnson will inevitably win, but if he's on the ballot paper and he's got 100, it means that they have to put it out to a vote to the membership of the Tory party. We're absolutely bonkers. <laughs> they are the most reactionary little Englanders that you ever come across. And they, well, they, they are balmy. And therefore, they would want to select the, one of their own, if you like. And if it was a choice between Sunak, who they regard as a socialist... <laughs> Because he's, he's put up taxes uh, so much. Uh, or uh, Johnson, and, and they, they, they pined for Johnson because it was uh, the way he was treated and so on and so on. He could well, well, he, he could get in there. And if he does come back as prime minister, of course, he might not that last that long. That's the problem because they've got a, a parliamentary committee to investigate this party gates uh, scandal. And if it has been proved that he liked the parliament, then he'll be suspended for Parliament and he could be out in his year and therefore they could be looking for another Prime Minister in January or February of next year. So it's a real headache. I mean, I wouldn't like to be a member of the ruling class at the moment, for God's sake. It's, a, it's, it's just, a, where do you go next? Everything you do seems to be wrong. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is an indication, yes, that revolution has been prepared it's been prepared by the ruling class itself. It's been prepared by the contradictions of capitalism. It's been prepared by the objective conditions that we face at the present time. But they've made everything worse and worse. I mean, the idea of Brexit, for instance, was madness from the point of view of the interests of British capitalism. I mean, Europe was the main market for Britain. For, you know, for, for 50 years, they had 50% of their profits were coming from Europe. And they kind of leave the, uh, the um, customs union and the single market just for the hell of it to say, oh, no, we're going to go buccaneering around the world. And we're going to recreate the British Empire, which they were saying. I mean, they are absolutely crazy. Crazy is the, is the word. And therefore, the, they, haven't got much, they haven't got much to hold on to. So the Tory party, if Johnson, I mean, it's going to be civil war. If he gets there... There's a whole number of, of MPs that they're going to resign from the, from the Tory party. It could split the Tory party. There'll be absolute civil war in the Tory party. And therefore, it'll be out of, out of commission, if you like, 
for quite a long period of time. I mean, it is remarkable even now, the fact that uh, uh, the latest opinion polls give the Tory party 14%. Labour are on 53%. You know, the difference is 39 points. It's never been known in the history of polling of any political parties. It is absolutely off the, st it's off the scales. And therefore, the idea that somehow even Johnson is going to rebuild the support, you know, in the, in the red wall seats, etc., and win the next election is uh, a bit of a pie-in-the-sky dream, really. Uh, but whoever gets the leadership in the, of the Tory party, you know, uh, I think someone said uh, the, arch, the, yeah, the Archangel Gabriel, I think, uh, would have a difficult job if they won the Tory leadership in order to turn things round. And he's probably got a point there. But the thing is that the, this, the Tory party was the main bastion of British capitalism, the political representation, been around for two, three hundred years. It was the main thing. And it's, it's been, been completely destroyed by these individuals and the way that they have uh, behaved. Of course, um, added to this is the, is the, 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 the they've attempt, they attempted to move in this direction of deregulation and so on, this mini budget which created an absolute Ferrari on the international uh, markets. The idea of uh, cutting taxes in order to bail out the rich, if you like, um, and at the same time just borrow money in order to do it, was clearly unsustainable given the plight of the British economy. I mean, the British economy is a basket case. That's no exaggeration. I mean, out of the, out of, out of the G20, out of 20 of the top countries, Britain will come 19 out of 20 in relation to the lack of growth next year. It'll be the worst performing country out of, 20, out of 20 of the G20 countries. The only other one worst performing is Russia, who, of course, is in war and has got enormous sanctions placed on the economy. So you can have an indication of what it's like. It'll be the worst inflation of all the European countries in Britain. In other words, it's the sick man of Europe. It's degenerated, and that's the product of the crisis of British capitalism, the failure of the ruling class to invest, to modernize, they prepare to speculate, invest abroad, and so on and so forth. Now the chickens have come home to roost in a big way. You know, they cannot sustain the living standards of the working class. That's the whole point about it. They have to make big cuts. And even Hunt said that was it, there's going to be eye-watering uh, decisions that have to be made and so on and so forth. I mean, austerity has not gone away, by the way. It's been there all the time. They just changed the name. But all they'll do, is they're going to intensify it. And, and that means enormous class struggle because the working class at the moment is not uh, passive as it has been over the last 40 years. The working class has reawakened in Britain. And that reawakening has represented a big strike wave, the biggest strike wave we had in 40 years, where workers who have not been on strike before are taking strike action. You know, as you see, the railway workers, we've seen the dock workers, we've seen the postal workers, the telecommunication workers, we've had barristers going on strike, we've had lots of sectors in, in, in Unite going on strike. I think there's, I forget how many strikes, 150, is it? Major strikes that have been involved in. I mean, it's incredible the, the, the bubbling up of an industrial wave at the present moment. Because why? Because of the inflation. Inflation now is at 10%. It was, inflation before was, was, was very little. So, there wasn't a, so you could probably manage to get along with all the extreme difficulties. Now it tips you over the edge. And of course, the increase in... in um, Interest rates I mean they'd be increasing mortgages, increasing rents. Um, the collapse of the pound also means that imports will be more expensive into Britain. So all these things are going to start flattening the working class. It, it's bad now, but it's going to get a damn sight worse in the next period. And therefore, this, this industrial movement is the beginning of re revival of the struggle, of the class struggle, of the class war as the Sun gracefully put it in the front pages of its newspapers a few months ago. But uh, it's coming on on top of, 
a working class, which is at, the, at, the, at its bitter end. There are many workers who have to take two jobs, maybe three jobs, in order to make ends meet. The, the poverty and squalor has gone up. Child poverty has in, increased. Food banks are increasing. All the, 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 uh, the problems that the working class faces has been compounded now by this cut in real wages. Of course, with the increase in energy prices, and they've gone up from what was about a thousand or thousand two hundred, went up to then it's gone up, gone up to two thousand five hundred this time. Next year they're talking about four thousand pounds per year on average for heating your house on energy. I mean, that puts everybody, it puts it out of the reach of many, many people. So this is going to be a desperate situation. We thought that the 1930s were bad. And yes, it was a depression. Oh, let's be, let's be, even then, in Britain, in the 1930s, the economy grew by 3% a year. British capitalism in the last 10 years has grown by 1.2% per year. In the 1930s, it was those who were unemployed who got hammered. You know, in Scotland, in Wales, in the north, and so on. Those who managed to get a job actually saw their living standards go up a bit because prices fell in the 1930s. There was a deflation. So we're going to have a position where workers are going to be worse off now than they were in the 1930s. That's the reality. And that's going to have a big, big impact on the anger and the bitterness which is building up in the working class, particularly young workers. When they see what's happening. And yes, we were talking about yesterday about the amount of, of discussions at the bus stops and so on and so forth. The politicization is taking place at the present moment in society. People are talking politics. They're looking, what is going on? What the hell is happening? It's not like before. And this shows the, the change in, in, in the mood and psychology of the masses themselves. And on the industrial front, there's talk even of a general strike from leaders who are under pressure from their rank and file. They have to talk left. And then you see Meg Lynch then is coming out. We need an uprising. I mean, these are, this is stirring up, if you like. It's, it's feeding also the mood of the workers when they hear this kind of language. And the mood of the workers is pressing on these leaders to make such statements. Even the right wing of the trade unions are also under pressure. Christine McEnany, the, ge- the right-wing general secretary of Unison, has come out and told her, we cannot tolerate this situation anymore in the health service where, where nurses and health workers are having their wages cut. We have to ballot our members. And there's going to be three quarters of a million health workers balloted in the next period. Three quarters of a million. There's teachers, there's head teachers who've never been in stunt strike in their lives. That's not into ballot. There's a fundamental awakening and change in the, in the working class. And that's not going to stop, is it? Because, of course, you might be able to get win a bit here, a bit there, but what they, well, you win in that hand, they'll take with that hand. You're never going to be satisfied. You're on a roller coaster all the time. And you have to fight and fight if you're going to get anywhere. And therefore, that's the, that's what's happening in these ballots. Even uh, Gary Smith, the general se- right-wing general secretary of uh, the GMB. I know Gary used to be in the militant. He used to be in Scotland in the militant. Yes, he was in sympathetic to socialist appeal at one point. But then he went off and, and done his career in the union and then moved to the right, of course, and became the general secretary. But he said, what we are facing now is like a combination of the poll tax riots with the winter of discontent in 1979. In other words, he's, that's the kind of picture he is putting forward, which is one of enormous upheaval of class battles that we have not seen for generations. That's the perspective opening up in Britain, not the quiet life that we've had before. It is a tidal wave that's facing the ruling class, a tidal wave that's facing any government that comes into office itself. And no wonder the... Uh, the Financial Times, the representative of finance capital in Britain, are call, is calling for a general election. Not that there the, the should be a Tory government and get, and get another, no, a general election. Why? Because, they, well, first of all, they have no confidence in the Tories. 
They've, 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 they're wasted. They're finished. And therefore, what we need is a new change. And of course, what they're looking for is a Starmer Labour government. And that's been the traditional role, by the way, of, of right-wing Labour governments. When the, when the Tories have behaved, behaved, or, or performed badly, then, well, they are, they're retired. In the, like in the, in the game of um, cricket, the second 11 are brought on, you know, to, to clear up the mess. That's the only re reason that they are brought in. And, of course, Labour now is no danger as far as the ruling class is concerned with Starmer at the leadership, where he's purged all the left wing, abandoned all the left wing policies, and completely uh, bowed down to capitalism, the market, the monarchy, the British flag, everything, and his uncle is bowed down to, in order to ingratiate himself with the ruling class. I'm your servant. I will do anything that you ask. I'm your bit. And that's, that's what he is. He's a right-wing uh, agent of the ruling class within the workers' organization, a snake, if you like, in the, in the workers' organization, together with the other Blairites and the right-wing uh, crew that are there who take over as, as, uh, as careerists and so on. And they, they will do the dirty. And of course, under these circumstances, whenever the election is called, because the Tories won't want an election, because they'll be annihilated, but they have to get one sooner or later. And given the crisis is going to unfold, who the hell knows when it's going to happen? I wouldn't know. But they have to have one by 2024. And therefore, it's like you will have a Starmer government, in my opinion. That's the way it's looking. Could be a majority government by the look of it. And we welcome it. We want the Starmer government. Put them in power. Let's let the, the working class experience the right-wing reformism of a Labour government, which they, they'll go through and feel the bitterness against, because the Tories, they will carry out the same policies as the Tories. They'll carry out the same dictates of the ruling class as far as they're concerned, and therefore attack the working class. Then so even that government, by the way, and it could have a big majority, I will say it now, will be a government of crisis. Because of the crisis in the capitalist system, they'll be a force to attack the working class. They can do no other. They have to reduce the enormous debt burden uh, on the, of the British state. 40 billion pounds worth of uh, if like economies will need to be made. And they will do the dirty. No doubt about it. And of course, uh, yes, I think as uh, Lenin said, didn't it, in relation to Ramsay MacDonald, we'll support Ramsay MacDonald like a rope supports a hanged man. I wouldn't necessarily put that in social appeal, but nevertheless, you can see I'm talking about. No, we want these people. Let the, the working class go through the experience. It will mean an enormous shift to the left on the basis of that, because there'd be a hatred. There's, even now, there's no real illusions in Starmer. The only reason why Labour's doing so well is the Tories are doing so badly. That's the only reason, nothing else. There's no, there won't be any great expectations, but there'll be pressure, and the unions will be demanding left, right, and centre what they'll be doing. And, and who knows what kind of conditions will be created before a Labour government comes in. There could even be a general strike on the basis they could, even be, they could fall into it. It's not that they want it. The TUC doesn't want it. The, the trade union leaders don't want it. But if they come off, for instance, they come forward with new legislation in order to uh, uh, further stymie the, the trade union movement by demanding... It's, it's, it, it workers go to work during a strike and, and, pro, 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 and provide a certain service level during a strike, for Christ's sake. No wonder um, Sharon Gray says, well, if you want to go down that road, it means the gloves are off. And that's where the pressure will be on. And they can stumble into this, as they stumbled in, in 26, as a matter of fact, or in 1972, when the dock workers were arrested and, there was a th and, the, and the movement moved and there was going to be a one-day official general strike, which would have turned into an all-out general strike. And then the official solicitor, no one ever heard of this guy, came along and said, hey, wait, are you out of jail? Okay, you're out of jail. Right, yeah. and, and calm down. That's what they did. They were definitely keen to make sure that, um, the, uh, you know, that it didn't get out of hand. And of course, once the workers are on the move, it's difficult to stop them. And that's the building up of this pressure that's taking place at the present time. The anger, the bitterness, it's hard to contain. It's hard to hold back. And of course, a new Labour government, well, 
They'll be under enormous pressure under, that, under those circumstances as well. And the trade unions will be pushing that Labour government. So therefore, we will have to, uh, yes, we'll, we, we will look at events, if you like. But clearly, when you look at the last five years, you can see how the right winger got away with murder, basically. Uh, Starmer got away with murder. The way they cleared out the left without hardly any resistance. And that's, like we mentioned yesterday, about the weakness of left reformism. I mean, Corbyn had the Labour Party in his hands. The left had the Labour Party in their hands, apart from the MPs and, and, and the apparatus, and they could have just, just sacked them. But they weren't prepared to break with the right-wing MPs, and the right-wing MPs were stabbing them in the back, left, right, and centre. It was the idea that they were comrades too. You know, that we, have to, you know, we would debate with them. And they were debating, they were stabbing him in the back. In fact, one said, I'm, I'm stabbing him in the front, not just the back. And they were, they were very open and, and brazen about it. And of course, using this, this uh, scandalous allegation of, of um, anti-Semitism, which they threw at the left, and instead of the left going on the offensive and denouncing it, and then going on the offensive to deselect all these bastards, that's the only way to do it. Why, and they would have split from the Labour Party. Good riddance to hell with them. They would have renewed and regenerated the Labour Party on class lines. But the left weren't prepared to do that. They capitulated to the pressure. They tried to appease the right wing in the Labour Party, which was the kiss of death. Because weakness invites aggression. And every time they, they, they buckled down, the right wing got firmer and firmer and more determined because they were backed by the ruling class. Of course, this weakness, as was pointed out yesterday, of left reformism is a political one. They do not have the confidence in the working class. They have no perspective of change in society. They may talk about socialism, but it doesn't mean anything to them. All they want is a kinder, nicer capitalism. They want to reform a bit here, tinker with the system, and so on. And therefore, inevitably, they accept the system and its, and its dictates. And what if, if you had a Labour government come to power, even if Corbyn came to power, look what happened with the markets in relation with the Tory government. Do you think they're going to be nice as pie and say, fine, fine? Of course not. They're going to blackmail, dictate. They're going to sabotage that Labour government, as we said they would do. And that the only way forward is expropriate capitalism. There's no middle ground here. And that's the lesson, really, of the uh, years of Corbyn. There isn't a middle ground. There's only the, the we have to take on the right wing and, and as the enemy and drive them out uh, uh, fully on the basis of a determination to go to the very end. That's the only way you do it. But as Trotsky said, inherent in reformism is betrayal. Why? It's not because there's some, as I said yesterday, they can be very sincere, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's the whole uh, point about it. And that if you accept capitalism, you accept the laws and the dictates of capitalism. And that's why we have to do away with it altogether. And we saw the way in which even in the unions, the left have, have, have capitulated. In unison, I was at the unison conference, and unison, had, its national executive had moved to the left. They had elected, elected, elected a left president in Paul Holmes. But the right wing were determined to get rid of him. Of course, what are they going to do? Sit back? It was important to the right wing to, to uh, attack the left. And as soon as they did that, the left started to capitulate. And they, they moved into identity politics then. And this was the sex of the Socialist Workers' Party and so on. And eventually, and during that week, instead of Paul being the president of the union, they said, no, you've got to stand down because you're not a woman, they said. We need a woman there. He was the, he was the leader of the left, for Christ's sake. He was attacked. He was known. He was the general secretary candidate of the left. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. And then they kicked him out of the presidential team because he wasn't black. It's so ridiculous for words how these people capitulate to identity politics under pressure from the right wing instead of you know, face up into it and say, we want class fighters. We want people fighting for our work on the working class and dedicated to the working class, whatever they are. That's the criteria that we should undertake in. And therefore, the... the
Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, we, we've always said, look, the crisis really can be brought down to a crisis of leadership. But the working class is prepared to fight if they're given a lead. They would even storm heaven if they had a lead. But of course, that lead is absent. And that is a task that we have to fulfill in reality. Lenin explained, there are four conditions for revolution, he said. One, a split in the ruling class. Well, I think the ruling class has split a bit at the moment. <laughs> Number two, that the middle class is in ferment. Well, I think they are, yes, they, they, with their mortgages, with their the inflation and so on, the businesses are going bankrupt. They are definitely in ferment as well. And the collapse in the Tory party is an indication also. Thirdly, the working class on the move. And they are on the move. It's a beginning. It's not the end, but they are on the move. And fourthly, the building of the revolutionary party, the existence of a revolutionary party, which does not exist at the present time. And therefore, that is our fundamental task in the next period. The other, other points will mature, are maturing, have matured. But the fourth one, which is the guarantee for success, needs to be built. You know, the revolution is going to happen whether we are here or not, comrades, because objective conditions will force the working class to move. What we are talking about is a successful revolution, and that requires a revolutionary party to lead the working class. And therefore, we have to say, on the basis of the changing consciousness of the working class, there will be layers who will draw, yes, radical and even revolutionary conclusions. Don't be, you'll be, you'll be shocked by what will happen. People wouldn't be, vote, will vote Tory, will end up in our ranks of our organization. I remember Felix, what was his name, um, Farrell Dobbs, rather, in the United States. He was the leader of the Trotskyists. In 1928, he voted for the Republican presidency of Hoover. Three years later, he was in the ranks of the Trotskyist movement and became a leader. The people, you don't have to go through oh, the right wing and then uh, you know, Tories and then right wing Labour and then uh, uh, left reformism. And then let's go, I guess, get to Marxism. You can have people who jump over their heads of that and draw revolutionary conclusions. That's the dialectic of it. And that's what we must understand as well, that the whole basis uh, that we face is the, is the need to build the organization, build the forces of Marxism. Of course, we cannot do that just by announcing it, and it will not be done uh, as events uh, move. We can't just spontaneously create something. It has to be built beforehand. That was the lesson of Lenin and the Bolshevik party, who put in painful years of building up the forces and when the opportunities ar arose, they were able to take advantage of it. Now, in February 1917, the Bolsheviks had 8,000 members. By October, they had 240,000 members. And, and, and the, the vast majority of the Soviets were under their influence, and they took power. Of course, I'm not saying it takes nine months. It will take a long... What we're going to have is a protracted revolution in Britain, more like the Spanish Revolution which went from 1931 to 1937. And even within that, you had two black years, two reactionary periods. Because a revolution is not a one act, it's a process of the transformation of the consciousness of the working class. But it's a process that begins and develops and extends. And then the, on the basis of that, it matures. And if you have a revolutionary party in place when it's matured, then you could lead the working class to power. We comrades, we have less than a thousand comrades. We're not far off a thousand. We need to get to that thousand. But we need to build to five thousand and ten thousand. That is entirely possible. Are you telling me there's not what five or ten thousand young people in Britain at the present time who would not join our organization? I tell you they exist. But we have to get them. We have to reach out. We have to build this organization. It will not be built for us. And that requires you ourselves to put the effort the determination in in order to build this organization to build the subjective factor 
Because without that, we are lost. With it, we will win. And if we can develop an organization, five, 10,000 on the basis of events, that will grow enormously under conditions of revolutionary fervor, as was, for instance, the POOM, which was a centrist organization, which grew from about 1,500 to 50,000 in the space of weeks on the basis of the Spanish Revolution. But you have to have that core first, the educated Marxist cadres that we have to recruit to the organization and develop and educate, win young workers to the organization. Through the youth, you win the older layers. That's the way to do it. But if we, if we consciously determine that this is the main task that we will perform, then we can reach those targets. We can build that organization. We can create the subjective factor which can lead to the victory of the working class in Britain and internationally and create a world fit for our class, for our people of plenty, no war, no poverty, but glowing living standards, a real life for our people, for our working class and the liberation of humankind. Keep standing. All right.